Hey y'all, my name is Susan Sparks and I'm the senior pastor here at Madison Avenue Baptist Church in New York City. We are a diverse community brought together by faith. We hope that you enjoy our service today. The title of my sermon this morning is L'Chaim, and don't mess it up. <laughs> now, okay, before I even start the sermon, I just want to preface this whole thing by saying, yes, I know I am trying to pronounce the word L'Chaim with a southern accent. I get that. Please work with me. I mean, you know, I'm doing the best I can. At least I'm not saying L'Chaim, you know, doing okay with it. So just work with me. I am so excited about the scripture that we have today that Heather just read for us. Honestly, I think this particular scripture may be the biggest, most dramatical, theatrical, Hollywood, bring it home moment in the Bible. And if it's not the one, it's got to be in the top three. So let me set it. Here's the setting, right? So here we are. for standing with Moses and the children of Israel on the banks of of the Jordan River just before crossing into the Promised Land. And because of an earlier mistake, Moses is not being allowed by God to cross this river. So after leading his people 
out of bondage in Egypt through the Red Sea and wandering in the desert for 40 years, he is about to say goodbye on the banks of the Jordan across from the promised land. It's the ultimate new day. It's the ultimate second chance for their people. And it is there that Moses gives his final sermon. I mean, I thought Easter was pressure. You know, this is big. This is big. So in this moment, Moses preaches this fiery message to his people, ending with one of the best bring it home lines ever, which is this. Choose life so that your descendants may live. I read the scripture over and over this week in preparing for the sermon, and every time I read that line, I envisioned Moses raising a glass and giving the great Jewish toast, L'chaim, which means to life. But of course, given what's at stake in that moment, I also can imagine Moses mumbling as an aside, and don't mess it up. I mean, let's look at the scripture just a little bit closer this morning, because I believe that it contains some very important lessons for all of us. Let's look at the words choose life. What does that even mean? Maybe it's actually easier to determine what it does not mean. For Moses, choose life meant not worshiping the idols of the Canaanites, the people who occupied the land where the children of Israel were headed. He knew that the children of Israel, like all of us have a tendency to head down the idle path. We've all been there. I won't ask for a raise of hands, but I know we've been there, right? I mean, we all remember the golden calf, right, at Mount Sinai. And Moses warns them earlier in the book of Deuteronomy. He says, you have seen these detestable things, their idols of wood and stone and their silver and gold. And it may be that there's some among you, Moses says, Someone whose heart is already turning away. I can imagine the people all looking at each other going, I don't know who he's talking to. I mean, this is good advice for us too. Because, you know, we may not have a giant golden cow in our house. Or maybe you do. Hey, to each his own. But we all have things in our life that we idolize. Things that we covet. Things that we prioritize over God's teachings, things of the world, things like money or power or the insistence on being right. These are things that make us feel good, but they don't advance the common good. As Moses says, these things do not lead to life. In fact, they lead to destruction because they lead us from things that are true and right. They lead us from God. Moses says in verse 20, loving the Lord your God, obeying him, holding fast to him, that, that means life to you. I mean, brothers and sisters, every day we wake up, Every day we open our eyes, we, like the children of Israel, are standing on the banks of the Jordan looking at the promised land of a new day. How will you live that day? Will we choose life? Loving God, obeying God, holding fast to God? Or will we put our priorities our heart behind things that steal our life, steal our light, steal our goodness. You know, these decisions apply to every aspect of our life. I mean, it starts when we get out of bed. We get out of bed and we gotta ask ourselves, how are we gonna live our day? When we walk into the world or walk into work, how are we going to conduct ourselves? When we walk into a meeting, a boardroom, a friend's home, a restaurant, a doctor's office, how are we choosing to live? What words do we choose? What emotions do we share? What impact do we have? I mean, think about it like this. If we worship the idol of money, 
then our decisions, our priorities, revolve around profits, not people. If we worship the idol of power, then our decisions, our priorities, revolve around what bolsters up the fortress of our ego, rather than channeling that power for the common good. If we worship the idol of being right all the time, which we tend to do, as Americans especially, then our decisions, our priorities, are made without any regard to the impact that that rightness has on other people. Let me give you a recent example of what choosing life, what l'chaim, in the midst of the idols of money and power and rightness looks like. About a week ago, the CEO of Walmart, Doug McMillan, announced that the giant retail chain will stop selling ammunition for military-style weapons and no longer allow customers to openly carry firearms in the store. The announcement came after two deadly shootings this summer inside Walmart in El Paso and South Haven, Mississippi. This was not a move by some big gun control organization. Honey, this was Walmart. If you ever told me I'd be standing in this pulpit preaching on Walmart, I would tell you you're crazy, but here I am. This was an extraordinarily courageous act. It's a move that's contrary to the concerns of profit. It's a decision that could potentially undercut their power base. It's a public statement that acknowledges the true impact from the failure to reach agreement due to the intractable sides of the gun control debate. And honey, that impact is crystal clear. I mean, just this week, the Times came out and announced that there have been 38, 38, 38 mass shootings in the United States this year. And please understand, mass shooting is defined as a shooting where three or more people are killed. I mean, Walmart chose life, literally and figuratively by taking a stand against the idols of money and, cho- and power and choosing a path for the greater good. I mean, will they suffer for it? Maybe, probably, but they broke new ground. They blazed a new trail and within days, others were taking that same path. CVS, Walgreens, Wegmans, and Kroger joining Walmart and asking customers not to openly carry firearms. You know, I have to ask the question, unless it's the day after Thanksgiving, why do you need a gun to shop? I mean, really? I don't get that. But people are screaming, you know, my gosh, my rights have been infringed. I got two things to say to that. One, you know, there's an awful strong argument that there is no constitutional right to bear arms unless it's military. Let's just put that out there. But more importantly, number two, as the old saying goes, just because you have the right to do something does not mean it is the right thing to do. Amen. Mm, mm Mm-mm-mm. Brothers and sisters, beware of the idols. Beware of money and power and rightness because they may feel good, but in the end, they do nothing for the common good. So, L'chaim, choose life and don't mess it up. And it's not that hard. I mean, even Moses said it in Deuteronomy. He said to his people, surely what I am commanding you today is not too hard for you, nor is it too far away. I'm gonna give you one quick example of a simple prayer I use to kind of help this happen. And I call it the giving prayer. Cause I made it up and that's what I'm calling it. So there it is. (laughs) But it's also about giving. It's three short little steps, three steps. Number one, give thanks. Before, Before you do anything, you stop and name three things very quickly you're thankful for. I'm thankful that I'm in a building, a beautiful building. I'm thankful for all of you. I'm thankful that um, I have a robe. Random, it doesn't matter, whatever it is. Three things quickly that you are grateful for. Number two, give notice. Name the idol with which you are struggling. And number three, most important, give it up. 
Whatever is drawing you from God, give to God. So let's say you're walking into a big presentation. Here's the three prayers. Number one, three things for which you are grateful. Bing, bing, bing. Number two, name the idol with which you're struggling. I might say, I'm struggling with self-doubt because Lord knows that's an idol. And number three, give it up. Give that self-doubt back to God so that your gifts from God can shine. What things are blocking you from God's power? And are you willing to let them go? At the end of his great sermon, Moses summoned Joshua to hand over the leadership and spoke the following words. And then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all of Israel, be strong and bold for the Lord goes before you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and bold for the Lord goes before you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Every day we wake up that we are given the gift of life, we too are standing on the banks of the Jordan looking at the promised land of a new day. How are we going to live it? What are we going to do with it? Will we be strong and bold? Will we choose life obeying God, holding fast to what is true? Or will we put our priorities, put our heart behind things that steal our life, steal our light, Steal our goodness. Brothers and sisters, the promised land awaits. So l'chaim, and don't mess it up. And the people said, Well, the moon is broken and the sky is cracked. Come on up to the house The only thing you can see Is all that you lack Come on up to the house All your crying won't do you no good Come on up to the house He conquered death and the cross Like he said that he would You gotta come on up to the house Come on up to the house Come on up to the house This world is not our home We're just passing through Come on up to the house There's no light in the tunnel, no irons in the fire. Come on up to the house. And you're singing lead soprano in a junk man's choir. Come on up to the house. Does life seem nasty, brutish, and short? Come on up to the house. And the seas are so stormy and you can't find a port Come on up to the house You gotta come on up to the house Come on up to the house This world is not our home We're just passing through So come on up to the house There's nothing in the world that you can do. Come on up to the house. And you're whipped by the forces that are inside you. Come on up to the house. Well, you're high on top of your mountain of woe. Come on up to the house. Should surrender, but you can't let it go. Come on up to the house. 
Come on up to the house. Come on up to the house. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. So come on up to the house. You gotta come on up to the house. You gotta come on up to the house. We are so glad that you came to be with us in worship today. If you are a visitor, I hope you remember that this is a community of faith in which you are always welcome and you will always be considered family. And until we see you again, may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And as we leave through those doors, let us always remember that every day that we are given, we are standing on the shores of the Jordan looking at the promised land of a new day. Let us always live that day with life and light and goodness. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Madison Avenue Baptist Church is located at 31st and Madison Avenue in New York City. Our website is www.mabcnyc.org.